everyone. Hi. Nice to see everyone here. Uh, welcome to the Baumer Lecture. Uh, my name is Jennifer Clark. I'm the head of the City and Regional Planning section. And it is nice to see so many of you here this evening. So I have the great privilege tonight to introduce to you Professor Nicola Lowe. Nicola is a uh, leading voice in our field of city and regional planning, in economic development planning, and particularly in inclusive economic development planning. Her work pulls together parts of the discipline that have long looked at questions around industrial restructuring and labor markets with questions of how institutions can make places more inclusive. So that work actually has culminated in recent years in a book called Putting Skill to Work, which I encourage each of you to look at. This is a rare piece of work that takes the question of jobs and quality jobs and the institutions that create quality jobs and thinks about how they actually build inclusive places. She is not talking about this book tonight, so you will all have to go and read this on your own time. I have it in my office if you're interested in borrowing it, too. So part of the work that, that uh, Nicola uh, brings to us today is new and novel work. And for some of you who were students, you might be really interested in this talk today because those of us who work on a career over decades, we still have some new ideas. And today, she's going to bring us some new ideas. And she's actually asked that we engage with her talk at the end, ask some questions. So I'm going to ask you guys to really think about the questions you might want to ask her as we get towards the end of the talk. She's told us that she's going to do about 30 or 35 minutes of this talk so that you guys can have some time to do that. So think in your heads as you're doing that. So Nicola is currently the chair of the Department of City and Regional Planning at uh, UNC Chapel Hill, which is one of the top uh, programs in the country. She is also a visiting professor at the Univ Lund University, which is in Sweden. She has worked with the International Labor Organization on, on consulting. She has worked, been funded by the Kaufman Foundation. She has, uh, has a extensive resume but really what it boils down to is that she is one of the leading voices in our field, and we are really pleased to have her here today. Please join me in welcoming Nicola Lowe. Um, well, thank you, Jennifer, for that incredibly kind introduction, and to all of you for this opportunity to present some new ideas on this topic of biophilic institutions. So this is a concept that I've been developing with a longtime collaborator of mine. So Natasha Iskander, who's listed on this slide. She is at NYU, and we've been working together for quite, quite some time. So a little over a year ago, we were invited to write an essay for the journal Daedalus. In fact, the essay just came out a few weeks ago. And we had the assigned task from the editor that we had to imagine a new moral economy for an Earth-friendly future. Trust me, this was no easy assignment, especially as we were coming at it as economic development scholars, certainly not environmental experts. But at a time of great uncertainty, when it seemed very hard to fully plan or predict a month ahead, much less years, decades ahead. We actually found it very grounding to go through this thought process together, to really be able to think about how to strengthen the connections between the economy and our natural world, rather than perpetuate this myth that they are somehow separate or inherently in conflict. So according to the organizational scholar Carl Weick, theorizing is really just disciplined imagination. So not wanting to really stray too far from our own disciplinary roots, we opted to anchor this thinking on institutional transformation to some of our ongoing research on the hidden creativity or talents of Latino immigrant workers 
a workforce that is too often trapped in low wage, low quality jobs in this country. And we landed on biophilia because we felt it captured more promising worker empowering actions that we had observed over several years. And so what I want to do is use our brief time together today to really bring you into that thought process, to introduce you to some of the conceptual threads that we're weaving together, and maybe even convince a few of you to join us in this process of institutional reimagination. So at the start of this conceptual journey, you're probably asking yourself, what the heck do we mean by biophilic institutions? So bio just means life, and philia means friendship, rooted in care, respect, and compassion for others. And we're applying it to this concept of institutions, which we and many others define as patterns of social engagement that sometimes codify into formal rules, policies, roles, routines. So when you put them together, think of these as institutions that privilege the connection between protecting Earth, protecting human livelihood. But as someone who's much more comfortable theorizing from grounded empirics, from real examples, I want to ease us into this concept today by first sharing some illustrative examples, which I'll then unpack in the second half of the talk, in order to make this concept more accessible and hopefully more relatable. All right. So the first case, it's from my hometown of Los Angeles. It involves an ongoing initiative that is popularly referred to as the Clean Truck Program. This is a program that was started about 15 years ago as an effort to reduce harmful vehicle emission, emissions in neighborhoods surrounding the Los Angeles and Long Beach shipping port. So these are low-income neighborhoods where childhood asthma and other respiratory diseases were off the charts 15 years back. Combined, these neighboring ports, they represent the largest commercial shipping hub in the United States. So products and people are moving across their borders fluidly. They're creating jobs for nearly 13,000 truck drivers and tens of thousands of more in other logistics-related occupations. The Clean Truck Program in Southern California, it phased in emission standards. So that eventually resulted in a total ban of older polluting trucks. And in fact, it continues to get updated as cleaner vehicles come online. But that mandated change, it's jeopardized the economic livelihood of the mostly Latino immigrant truck drivers. So these are the workers that drive trucks in and out of these two ports. Now, this was an extremely precarious workforce to begin with. In fact, one that is a result of earlier actions taken by our federal government under deregulation is treated much like workers we associate with the gig economy and ride-sharing companies like Uber and Lyft. Port trucking, it also involves questionable forms of subcontracting, with many companies misclassifying their drivers as independent contractors, rather than hiring them as permanent employees. The onus is also on the drivers to buy and maintain these vehicles, even though work schedules, access to job sites, even pay rates, they're all tightly controlled by the trucking companies. But the financial risk associated with buying a new truck, it's even greater than what we associate with buying a passenger vehicle. The price of a new truck, one that qualifies as clean, it's close to $300,000. And even though there are dealerships in the area that offer favorable leasing terms, these immigrant drivers would have to take on extremely high levels of personal debt if they were required to buy these trucks outright. In fact, one report that was published in the lead up to the clean truck program anticipated this would soon be a fast spreading foreclosure crisis on wheels. <clears throat> 
So fortunately, this problem was anticipated. It was anticipated by worker and immigrant advocacy groups who also insisted they have a seat at the negotiating table when this program was first being designed. The first solution they pushed, it was bold. Some might even say radical. It centered on the port authorities as regional government agencies flexing their institutional muscle by requiring trucking companies that actually wanted access to port business to first revert all drivers from subcontractors to direct employees. And that would mean the companies would then have to provide a guaranteed living wage and worker benefits. But beyond that, it also created this formal pathway for shifting more of the responsibility for purchasing the trucks back onto the companies themselves. So the port of Long Beach, they hesitated. They were very worried that this requirement would mean they could lose out on business to other West Coast ports. But importantly, the Port Authority of Los Angeles, this is the bigger of the two ports, they were on board. They were willing to give it a go. A problem, however, quickly emerged. So this decision, it was met by a legal challenge from an association of trucking companies. And the judge in this case, a progressive, I will add, she ruled the Port Authority in Los Angeles had in fact overstepped their institutional bounds as currently defined by federal law. So Los Angeles, even though they wanted to give this a go, they could not require a universal change to existing employment contracts. But still, this was not a major setback. The broad-based coalition at the heart of this effort, and that includes representatives from environmental groups, social justice organizations, labor unions, including the Teamsters, and even folks from the mayor's office, they had a backup plan. They anticipated there would be some kind of resistance to this. And plan B, it remains in place today, more than a decade later. So what is the alternative? Well, at its core is something called a concession agreement. And this means that even if a truck is deemed environmentally friendly or clean, the owner of the vehicle must first complete an extensive application process in order to gain access to the ports. That means the truck in question has to be associated with an existing corporation that is legally registered and has a tax ID, and the driver of the truck has to be insured and eligible for workers' compensation. Now, this doesn't necessarily preclude legitimate forms of independent contracting, but the added scrutiny here, the expense, it's really forced most companies to end questionable forms of employee misclassification. And the same judge, the same judge as the previous case, she did allow this backup provision to take hold, this time also justified under federal law, but focused on national security and safety concerns, not worker or employment rights. Companies quickly responded to the second decision, and they did revert many of their drivers to employees. Still, even here, the solution was not perfect. And in fact, about 10 years ago, a national newspaper published a high-profile series showing compelling evidence that some companies were pushing the financing risk back onto immigrant drivers. And they were doing this by deducting payments for new trucks and their maintenance from monthly paychecks, even though that action violates labor law. Still, the visibility gained through that reporting, it's given a further boost to ongoing institutional actions. So labor unions, for example, they've increased their efforts to organize drivers who as employees, not subcontractors, are now eligible for union membership and collective bargaining. The port authorities, for their part, they have continued to put pressure on retailers, which includes Walmart and Amazon, in order to level the playing field for smaller truck companies. And they did this by initially requiring those retailers and also third-party shipping companies to put 
money into a fund that was then made available to the trucking companies in order to offset the cost of purchasing newer, cleaner vehicles. But they're also pushing these companies to establish long-term contracts with newly formed trucking cooperatives that the Port Authority has helped to create, bringing together groups of smaller companies in order to increase their own relative bargaining power. The coalition at the heart, is, are the heart of this effort, it's also taking further action. So they've been working to strengthen immigrant rights, but also to push towards decarbonizing global shipping. So I love this case. It's one that I actually teach in most of my classes because every year it keeps evolving and new things um, keep adding in the face of shifting environmental and equity concerns. So I'm going to now jump to the second case, and I'm going to move through this one more quickly. But this one also involves immigrant workers, this time, however, in an even more precarious position because these immigrants are undocumented, meaning they have very few claims to legal protection and rights. Nonetheless, here too, we still find the makings of a biophilic institutional response. So this case is rooted in New Orleans, and its origins is, are tied to Hurricane Katrina. So tens of thousands of immigrant workers, they traveled to that area in the immediate aftermath of Katrina in 2005, some migrating directly from sending communities in South and Central America. Their primary role was not rebuilding New Orleans and the Gulf Coast, but rather preparing sites to be rebuilt by others. An essential task still that involves dismantling damaged structures and removing wet and charred materials. This is obviously difficult and dangerous work, and it's often exposing this workforce to incredibly harmful substances, so asbestos, fiberglass, mold, a laundry list of other nasty chemicals. And this health risk, it did not end with Katrina. Their involvement in disaster recovery continues as demand for recovery services increases with time. This workforce has also become more transitory in response to extreme weather events. So they're moving from one hard hit community to the next. And the companies that are doing this recruiting, they're embedded within vertical structures. So at the peak are a half dozen highly profitable companies. These are multi-million dollar ventures, some that are backed by private equity investors. And these privileged few, they benefit from guaranteed access to lucrative government contracts managed by federal agencies, including FEMA. So below the top ranks here, we find layers of subcontractors with labor recruiters or brokers buried deep at the bottom. And their primary role in all of this is to hire and transport new immigrants, often under the false pretense that they will provide good jobs, steady work. More typically, however, these jobs are low paying, poor quality. Some don't even pay at all, and wage theft is rampant. Undocumented immigrants are often too scared to speak up and complain. Many owe thousands of dollars to human traffickers, meaning that far too much is at stake to initiate a legal challenge on their own. And these labor brokers, they know it, they exploit it. And yet even here, even in the most highly precarious work setting, we still find evidence of biophilic practice that strives to protect both life and livelihood. So for now, that effort centers on the actions of a nonprofit that's called Resilience Force. Resilience Force advocates for policy change within this industry while also prosecuting cases on behalf of groups of immigrant workers. And they also provide alternative sources of income. They've formed a worker center that helps to place workers in communities that have been underserved or marginalized themselves, while also guaranteeing workers living wages, good benefits. 
And more recently, Resilience Force, it's stepped up their game. They've actually partnered with a large reconstruction company, so one of those multi-million dollar giants at the top of the subcontracting heap. In partnership, they've actually co-created a proposal for raising industry-wide standards that would cover all disaster work. And they're pushing these standards together in their discussions with federal agencies. So if these standards were adopted by FEMA or the Department of Labor, say, they would add teeth to an existing requirement that subcontractors have to adhere to basic wages, housing, safety standards. They would do this by increasing the number of federal labor inspectors and also raising penalties for noncompliance. But it's important to note that even while they're waiting for a government response, they're still gaining traction. And this is because of the forefront of this effort, this partnership, is one of the largest recovery companies that's willing to push these standards by pressing for change across their own subcontracting networks. And there are other measures that are being used to bring more companies along. So Resilience Force, it's created formal training and skill certification systems. And that includes exploring a new federally recognized apprenticeship, using these added workforce services to transform jobs in disaster recovery from short-term and unpredictable and dangerous to career enhancing, and in ways that ultimately benefits the broader industry as well. They are repositioning the workforce to support forward-looking economic activities, not just deconstructing buildings, but restructuring vulnerable communities so that they can become more resilient to environmental change. All right, so I've shared the details of these two cases. So what I wanna do now is to just step back and ask what makes them institutionally biophilic and what shared features do they reveal that suggest opportunities for further biophilic action? At their core, these institutional responses challenge a commonly held assumption that economy and nature represent two separate and competing realms. But in doing so, they also remind us that some interactions between the economy and nature can be deeply destructive, such that human-centered environmental damage, including climate warming, can intensify existing structural inequities, just as economic disparities can worsen climate-induced suffering. Yet these cases challenge the notion that this exploitative loop is necessary and inevitable. Instead, they really show us that this shared precarity results from a particular set of choices, political and economic choices, that are themselves institutionally reinforced. Dominant institutions that structure and control local, national, even global markets profit from production practices that are doubly threatening for workers in the surrounding ecologies. So in Los Angeles, we see the way that global logistics players really touch down in very particular places, not only poisoning the air and water of surrounding communities, but maintaining these practices by wielding threats to move their business to another coastal city. In the area of disaster recovery, the biggest companies enjoy near monopoly power. They're gobbling, gobbling up smaller competitors while aggressively lobbying federal agencies to relax standards for their further enrichment. These are powerful forces. And admittedly, they may seem very hard to budge. Yet by revealing the institutionalized nature of this relationship between economy and the environment, these two cases reveal the possibility for alternative institutional configurations to take root. We see that for destructive patterns to persist, they actually require constant institutional attention and reinforcement. Institutional actors need to promote and defend practices that continue to damage the economy and nature 
also meaning that institutional counterforces can emerge as a powerful check. So Karl Polanyi, he told us this nearly 80 years ago. He called out the myth of the self-adjusting market by really drawing back the curtain to reveal the actual institutional arrangements that protect that political fiction, pointing to the actions of privileged individuals and corporations to amass and concentrate obscene amounts of wealth on the flawed assumption that humans and nature are simply resources for their own profit. And much like Polanyi's message of hope, which he delivered at the end of his book, The Great Transformation, we believe our biophilic cases are also grounds for charting new institutional terrain. So what then is the basis for that institutional alternative? Is it a socialist revolution, so totalizing and upending, as Polanyi would have liked? or instead something a bit closer in reach with its makings in what we might call the institutional everyday. So this brings me to a second shared feature. We see in both of these cases and others that we've been collecting evidence of building solidarity on the basis of shared vulnerability and mutual dependence. And I think this is worth a bit of reflection in a room here of scholars, practitioners, students, some of us working on equitable economies, others on sustainability, though rarely both. Our respective subfields and professions often force that separation, limit our choice set, which also plays out in the worlds of advocacy and policy setting. So in my particular field, which is labor studies, there are numerous instances where labor advocates, and that includes labor unions, they perceive environmental protections as threats to jobs and economic security. And those advocates, they're not inherently wrong in presuming this. Environmental actions have been taken by national and subnational governments um, that intensify rather than combat poverty. So we can see an example of this with regressive gas taxes, for example, which disproportionately affect low-income families and individuals, hurting workers that often depend on gas-guzzling older vehicles for their livelihoods, taxi drivers, food deliverers, truck drivers, and certainly construction workers, all workers that are not likely to have sufficient disposable income to quickly change to cleaner alternatives. But the coalitions involved in these two cases avoid that common misstep from the start. And they do this by knitting together concerns of economic equity and environment in ways that fosters common connection and with it builds power. So low-income families living near the ports now relate to and even sympathize with low-paid truck drivers that navigate through their streets. In fact, they've joined them in protest over the years, just as drivers themselves have come to recognize that they also share the same contaminated air as those living near the ports, and they therefore have a shared stake in a cleaner future. And there are other expressions of solidarity that are in play here as well, reaching much deeper into the economy as they align equity and environment. In Los Angeles, the coalition that is pushing protections for truck, truck drivers, they're also advancing solutions for smaller trucking companies. So these are mom and pop operations that are equally positioned in a precarious way in geographically stretched supply chains. They're suffering similar threats to their own livelihood as the immigrant workers that depend on the jobs they create. Um, uh, and drive their fleets. So if the only response here is just to shift that economic burden from drivers to smaller firms, then inequality obviously persists. And knowing this, members of the Clean Truck Coalition, they've used their influence to negotiate protections for vulnerable business owners, also tapping collective power to force global shipping interests to accept greater financial responsibility and risk. 
In Louisiana, solidarity is also based on class identity. Recovery workers are not the only ones being dismissed or overlooked by federal agencies. Low-income families often cannot afford flood insurance and as a result have limited claims to federal rebuilding assistance. So resilience force, it makes that exclusion the basis for shared connection. They're actually providing low wage, sorry, low cost services, sometimes free of charge, while also helping poorer households gain access to other essential services. And in doing so, they're starting to chip away at entrenched political and cultural barriers. Poor white families in the US South, some who may have voted for political candidates who are anti-immigrant, now are learning to see immigrant recovery workers as trusted allies, building what political scientist Margaret Levy calls communities of fate that extend the bounds of shared interests and with it strengthen the basis for further political and collective action. And this brings me to the third and final feature of these institutions that I will end with. The notion that the, that the institutions at the heart of these cases, remember those patterns of social engagement that sometimes formalize as rules, laws, policies, they're alive and lived themselves. So what does institutional aliveness mean in this context? So at one level, it simply reflects the ongoing nature of the responses that actors continuously work on that advance incrementally. The sheer complexity of the issues that they're tackling here necessitates a dynamic and evolving approach. And given that complexity, there's also an element of indeterminacy, meaning it's very difficult to predict or anticipate what lies ahead, what doors may open, or what sticking points might surface. Some effort is made to anticipate emergent challenges, and there's hints of contingency planning in these cases. But institutional change here is not treated as a linear, predictable process nor is there a clear end in sight. There is an openness to continuity and uncertainty, an approach that political economist Charles Sable describes as looking for trouble, as incrementally working through existing problems while actively surfacing others to engage and address. And this realization suggests broader implications for how we conceptualize human agency and institutional change. So many of us in this room, trained in planning and more broadly, the social sciences, were often taught to see institutions quite differently from this, as monolithic structures, durable, fixed, ordering entities, even if they manifest informally as deeply entrenched norms, values, roles, routines. But in these cases, we see something very different, more fluid and dynamic but equally more creative. The actors in these cases don't assume or experience rules, norms, roles so precise, so persuasive as to determine their action. Nor do they treat institutions as external forces imposed on them from the outside or where change through human agency and willpower is the exception, only occurring at fleeting moments when actors encounter a rare opening, a window as it's often called, from which to contest or launch a challenge. By contrast, we see with these cases something that's more in line with what political scientists call the quote, artifacts of living in and through rules, and where life in institutions entails ongoing adaptation, tinkering and retrofitting, keeping institutions relevant to the ongoing flow of circumstance. So in her amazing book, which I highly recommend, um, I read it last year, called The Mushroom at the End of the World by anthropologist Anna Singh, 
we see that even within the most extreme and brutal forms of economic extraction, where environmental damage and destruction often go unchecked, there are still alternative social arrangements and engagements that can inspire hope and foster inclusion. So in biophilic terms, these are test beds for building new forms of assembly and political power from which to transform mainstream institutions from sources of perpetuated damage to resources for restoration and collective hope. But she also cautions us not to simply imagine their existence in the abstract or as speculative. We must actively search for their presence in the here and now, reflecting on actual, real cases, existing cases, to encourage collective learning and interplay, and ultimately, to further institutional creativity. As economic development scholars, Natasha and I have opted to hold up contemporary cases that concurrently challenge the precarity of workers and the environment. But as we puzzled through this concept of biophilia, we found ourselves collecting other related cases, some of which I hope will resonate with your own work. There's one involving the transition to sustainable public transportation, also started in my hometown of Los Angeles, called the Jobs to Move America Coalition. There's another in Cairo that uses public art to raise support for the circular economy by celebrating marginalized communities that collect, sort, and recycle other people's garbage. And we have cases that involve affordable housing developments, and that includes one in Alaska that involves an especially novel alliance between architects, engineers, home builders, and indigenous communities, all working together to develop alternative approaches to home building that not only generate not only guarantee generational wealth for the community, but do so by making structures transient, ensuring physical assets relocate with the community in response to changing environmental conditions. And what we love most about this particular case is the way it also centers on the lived experience of the past, so tapping ancestral knowledge that's been carried down over the generations from when indigenous communities were once nomadic and moved with the seasons, leveraging that collective wisdom to guide and inspire institutional creativity today. So I'm happy to share the details of these cases if you're interested, but in the spirit of shared vulnerability, let me end here with a set of questions that we are asking ourselves as we consider the broader relevance and potential of this concept of biophilic institutions. Are we too ambitious or not ambitious enough? Should we reach beyond the nature-economy interface to consider other social and institutional connections? And finally, how do we measure and monitor biophilia, track its progress and diffusion with time? So I imagine that some of these questions are ones you are also asking. And while I might not have the most convincing answer today, my hope in sharing them is to instead emphasize that we're really still planting conceptual seeds, and with the hope that maybe some of you will join us in making them flourish and grow. So thank you. <laughs>